Um, my name is Amy Williamson. I'm Deputy Director for the Iowa Department of Education. I am not your host for this afternoon, so um, I am going to turn it over to Larry Bice from the Department of Education to get started this afternoon. Um, as soon as I pop over to the slides for today, uh, the slides um, will be posted uh, on our website and the Workforce Development's website uh, after we do the presentation. Um, so I uh, understand that you don't have access to them at this moment, but if you just follow along, we'll make sure you have access to them later. So let me share my screen. Take it away, Larry. Okay, thank you. Um, and Amy, did you see um, Chris's note in the chat for adding um, one more person as a panelist? Never mind, we got him. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Oh, I didn't see it. We're good. Thank you. Um, so, welcome to the webinar. Um, I again, my name is Larry Bice. I work in the Iowa Department of Education. I'm going to start us off and talk for a little bit, um, and then um, two colleagues from in this work from Iowa Workforce Development, Chris Byam and, and Mimi Willoughby are gonna um, do quite a bit of talking. They're doing the bulk of the, the work going forward. Um, <clears throat> but I can I do wanna mention that this is a, um, this is certainly a, uh, a, a joint action. Um, I'm not sure who has the slides, whether it's Hannah or Amy, but if we could go to the next one. So <clears throat> what we're going to do today, I'm going to I'm going to give you a little bit of program information, and then um, we'll switch it over to um, we'll switch it over to um, Iowa Workforce Development to talk about award information, um, how to apply, and then you know anybody will answer questions as we can. Um, next slide, please. So where this comes from, <clears throat> last year in legislation, um, House File 868. Uh, identified a task force to look at growing the um, teacher workforce or actually diversifying the teacher workforce, excuse me. And um, the task force and the legislation identified a number of positions that needed to be on the task force. Um, we filled those positions. There were 25 people on the task force. Um, and we met about nine times. And if you want, <clears throat> if you want to see the task force report, it's um, posted on this, the um, Iowa Department of Education website. And I just, in the chat, I just put a link to where that um, task force report is. Um, this is, um, this is an earn and learn program. So it's just that you're going to be learning, you're going to be earning um, through two registered apprenticeship pathways to become a paraeducator or a teacher. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, it's funded through ESSER funds, um, our ESSER, ESSER three funds. Um, <clears throat> and there are some, some limits to that. And we'll talk more about that later. And, um, and it's, there are grants that's, it's the, the, um, the money comes through grants that are being awarded through Iowa Workforce Development. Um, if we could go to the next, slide and, and the slide after actually. <clears throat> so this is the, the basic model. The task force came up with one pathway basically, which was to, to identify high school students who would make good teachers or we think would make good teachers or you think would make good teachers um, with some emphasis on um, students from populations that are underrepresented in the teaching force. And then through a registered apprenticeship model, help them work their way to becoming a teacher. So there will be, um, you know, the the um, <clears throat> the work part or the earn part where they'll be working as a, an aide or a paraeducator, and then the learn part where they'll be earning um, credit toward degrees so that ultimately we can achieve uh, BOEE teacher certification at the end. So that's the pathway that the task force came up with and what we've done, um, and again, the task force did this was there are two entry points. One entry point is the high school to adult, high school and adult to paraeducator rep, um, registered apprenticeship. So this idea is high school juniors um, 
enter into this apprenticeship, they will do coursework. The idea is that they can do some um, dual credit coursework, but then after high school, they'll do more coursework. Again, this idea is a partnership with a community college that can get them toward that associate's degree. And they will do work for the school districts as a part of that earned part of the registered apprenticeship. And we put in their high school and adult because there may be adults working in a school um, that don't have a degree, um, maybe um, a, you know, not, a, a, not a registered para, not a certified para, um, but the school district, you may think, hey, you know, this is a great person to put into this model. So um, it's open to high school students and adults within the district. <clears throat> the other pathway, the other entryway, is paraeducator to teacher registered apprenticeship. And this is designed to take existing paras, ideally existing paras with an associate's degree. And it's a two-year model to take us to um, to, to uh, a teaching license. So to get that bachelor's degree um, and get that teacher's license along with it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And that requirement is a, a partnership with a um, educator prep program. Um, do the paraeducators need to be certified? No, not necessarily. Um, next slide, please, Amy. So I wanna show you, this is, um, after the, the task force came up with the pathways, um, what we did is looked at how do we fund it? Um, and once, uh, you know, once the, we were able to procure $9, nine million for um, of ESSER funds, um, <clears throat> the, um, it, we, we started putting some, some money toward it, some identifying some costs and some money toward it. So the high school, both, both pathways, the high school and adult to paraeducator and the paraeducator to teacher, um, the plan is that we start in fall 2022. The program duration for the high school or adult to paraeducator is two to three years. A high school student design is three years. Um, the um, paraeducator to teacher design is two years. Eligible participants, this is an important part, because it's ESSER funds, money has to go to public school districts. So that is the base of the partnership. Um, and then that public school district will partner with a community college or a four-year college or university working toward that associate's um, degree. And on the paraeducator to teacher, working with a four-year college university that has a teacher ed program, working toward that bachelor's degree. Now there is a service commitment that applies to adults. It does not apply to high school students, but any adults that enter this program, there's a commitment to stay in Iowa, work in Iowa for, um, for three years. <clears throat> Covered costs for a high school student, um, a high school student would work as a teacher's aide. A high school student is not old enough unless that person's 18, is not old enough to be a paraeducator can work as a teacher's aide in the district somewhere. Um, and the, the, um, the grant will support $12 an hour, which is an average para pay, but will support $12 an hour for that teacher's aide. And then <clears throat> after that, um, the, um, as the person is working as a para for the district after graduating from high school, the grant will pay for half of that para salary. The idea being that um, you know, you've already got paras working for you, but this helps offset the cost. For, um, for two years, this um, grant will pay for the um, tuition for this person. So um, it'll, it'll get them to, basically it's the grant is designed to pay two years of tuition. So if, um, you know, if you do a dual credit course during high school, then that's not a part of the cost. So you'll be able to carry that out longer. Um, you know, it's, um, we're anticipating 25 to 30 grants to districts um, with about 100 and anticipated individual participants. For the teacher prep one, um, the teacher prep program um, tuition is paid um, for two years. We figured this, the 
tuition at the Regents full tuition, about 16 grand a year. Um, but this is open to public and private universities and colleges. It's just, there's gonna need to be some discount there um, to get to the 16 grand a year. Um, and this will also will cover 50% of the para salary throughout this time. Again, looking at 2025 grants, um, potentially 100 um, anticipated individual participants. And um, now if we can go to the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and Mimi to talk about funding. Uh, so in partnership with uh, IDEA, or I'm sorry, not IDEA, the Department of Education, our ultimate goal is to make sure that we're cultivating partnerships between school districts um, and you guys would be considered um, employers um, and then also partnering with the community colleges, universities, and also other providers as needed um, to make sure that we are creating a hub for teacher and paraeducator, um, a pathway for each one of you. Um, we ultimately feel that um, you are able to um, grow a registered apprenticeship within your own um, area uh, that consists of two different pieces of a module. First of all, it's the related training, which we call RTI and also the on the job training uh, that you would have. So if you were gonna create a model with a, with a high school students, for instance, you would hire them as a, um, as a paraeducator or as an associate, and um, they would be using classroom instruction to um, also gain that learning and that experience to then provide um, the on the job training right there at the high school as they're going through or the school that you are having them assigned to. Um, we also, uh, you would be earning a paycheck during that time. Um, so it's very important to uh, make sure that you understand that you are hiring uh, these people on or you have them already um, accessible. So it could be one of the adults that is an associate within your, within your program. Um, one of the pieces that we also uh, added in here is making sure that we implement strategic recruitment. Um, we wanna increase the number of eligible paraeducators and high schools that re receive that competitive employment wage. And we also are talking about stackable credentials. So like if you are looking at, somebody asked the question already, can you do both programs? Absolutely, if, if your district is doing both registered apprenticeship programs, that is a stackable credential that will, um, you could go from a para to a teacher. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> one of the advantages for a registered apprenticeship is that uh, you also are gaining an industry recognized uh, national credential from the Department of Labor. Um, and that will also tie to the credentialing pieces that you would need for the Department of Ed or the BOE here in Iowa. Um, our ultimate goal is to make sure that um, we get a wide spread of uh, our population and make sure that we are helping and supporting the growth within uh, the education um, occupations. Um, and then the last thing is, is making sure that we're supporting the regional connections and giving um, as many, trying to get as many schools and programs together to make sure that we are um, growing registered apprenticeships throughout the state. Some of you have already created registered apprenticeships. Um, one of those, uh, those schools that have done that or those programs that have done that, um, basically what ends up happening here is that you would end up creating an outline of the standards. And um, we have Brian Dennis uh, on here. Um, one of the things that we just added to the application portal on Iowa Grants is um, both of the work processes or the standards that need to be met in both at, uh, the paraeducator and the teacher standards. Um, so those of you that have been through uh, creating a registered apprenticeship, you would outline the classes uh, that would support those standards. And then we would partner with the uh, Office of Apprenticeship to add teacher and para to um, your registered apprenticeship as is. If you aren't a registered apprenticeship um, sponsor, then that's where we would come in at Iowa Workforce Development, um, sit down with you with our 
business marketing specialist or uh, specialist and end up helping facilitate that growth to get you to um, a registered apprenticeship with the Office of Apprenticeship. Um, so that would be something that you would be partnering with Iowa Workforce Development in creating. Um, we know we've talked to many schools um, throughout the state that's interested in creating registered apprenticeships and um, we're prepared to help support those, um, those growth opportunities. Next slide. Um, we've included these performance measures. Um, these, are, these are pieces as you are going um, to apply for the grant. Um, we wanna make sure that uh, we understand the number of apprentice, uh, apprentices that we're gonna have, um, the anticipated wages. Obviously, many of you have different uh, scales that you use from, so making sure that that would be in there. As a registered apprentice, it must include at least one increase um, and up to four. Um, so that depends on how that would work um, throughout your own system. Um, the number of apprentices uh, from underrepresented populations, number of apprentices that complete the program. Um, obviously, we wanna make sure that this program is, is going off without a hitch and that we're getting our apprentices to the conclusion. Um, we also uh, wanna know how many credits, uh, credentials that they're earning, um, and then the total number of credentials earned. So we will be tracking that as performance measures as you guys are applying for those. And um, as we hand the, the distribution, uh, distribution of funds. Next slide, please. So we've had many questions based on um, the eligibility information. So um, this is only for public school districts um, eligible are eligible to apply as those funds are ESSER funds and they can only be awarded to um, public school districts. Um, and then obviously we've talked to, we've, we've uh, talked a little bit about the districts must partner with one or more community colleges, institutions of higher education and or uh, related training providers that are able to award credit toward relevant degree. Um, we don't wanna just limit it down. We, we want you to have the flexibility to be innovative and creative in um, growing your program and meeting the needs of your community and how that would look. Um, so that's where the registered apprenticeship kind of flexibility comes in. So uh, each one of the school districts has a little bit of that, um, that ability to be innovative and creative. Next slide. The minimum number of apprentices um, required for each cohort is 10. Um, so smaller districts, it would be good to partner. Um, I've talked to many different school districts that are looking at different partnerships around. Um, so that would be a good way of making sure that they're getting to that cohort of 10. Um, and then obviously it says districts unable to achieve the minimum number, um, they're encouraged to partner with uh, districts close by. Once again, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, districts are now in this instance are considered the business. Um, so um, you will be, you'll be, con you'll be considered the sponsor. Um, in many, in many cases uh, for high school registered apprenticeships at the current time, um, we look as a, at a high school as the sponsor and an intermediary um, with a business. Now you are consolidated to the sponsor and the business um, because you'll be providing um, the employment piece of this registered apprenticeship. Um, one thing that we would ask for is to provide an MOU proving that it is, a, is partnering with a community college and or a four-year uh, college or university. Um, and that also includes the uh, other uh, providers that can offer credit. Um, we also wanna make sure that you're hiring current or employ um, high school students or non-certified para educators as registered apprentices. So um, there's a lot of different ways that you can create that model 
um, with flexibility with what you need. I talked to a school district today um, that is looking um, to do that. You can also take into consideration classes that students have already taken. Um, so as you're creating a registered apprenticeship, if you sign off on a class like a child development class or um, that meet the standards in the work processes that are on that iowagrants.gov uh, website under the appendixes, um, those pieces um, you can, if they're employed with the district or if they've taken classes, you can give them credit for those standards at that time. And then uh, we're gonna seek reimbursement of funds on a quarterly basis um, by June 30, 2024. And then any uh, unexpended grant money will come back. And then those will, uh, every year we will be uh, requiring for uh, detailed reports on those um, accountability pieces uh, as of December 31st of each year to Iowa Workforce Development. And we'll provide the support in Iowa Works uh, to train you with how you can submit that information. There's a question, um, so alternative schools don't qualify, right? Uh, if that alternative school is within a district, um, then they would be eligible. Um, this is primarily for school districts. So a school district that does have an alternative school could qualify. Am I correct, Amy? I think that would be right. Okay, thank you. Um, Larry, did you wanna talk about the use of grant funding? This is something that you worked out. Yeah, I, I just wanted to talk about the, the how we figured out the dollars. And I'm going to ask um, folks that um, if you're throwing questions in the chat, just throw them in the Q&A. We have 24 right now. And so at the end of the presentation, the presentation may answer some of those. And if it doesn't, at the end of the presentation, we'll go through those and we'll provide an answer to, to, to every question that's in there. Um, the, the funding, what we did basically is we took $9 million, which is what the, um, we were allotted here from, from ESSER funds and then just divided it down to see, okay, how do we, you know, how many people can we get? Um, and <clears throat> what we looked at is the, um, currently the average um, community college tuition is $6,000 a year. So we added $1,000 for fees. Um, the average Regents institution is $16,000 a year. We add, or yeah, 16, we added $1,000 for fees. Um, an hourly rate average for Paris is $12. So what we did is to help the, the school system support paying those teachers aides, we budgeted that at 12 bucks and then uh, budgeted half of that um, to pay Paris moving on after that. Um, there were several reasons that we chose half but one of them is to try to increase the number of people um, that, that can be awarded. Um, and I will mention also um, that, you know, you may ask why a cohort of 10 and the cohort of 10 is because um, colleges and universities generally um, can't offer a course, a specific course, uh, unless they have 10 people in the, in the course. So with a cohort of 10, then we're assured that the courses will run and we don't have to run into any issues with a course not being able to run because of not enough people. Okay, thank you, Chris. Is that our last slide? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna turn this over to Brian Dennis. Uh, he can talk a little bit about the Iowa grant application process. Um, and kind of give a quick overview of how that grant process will work um, for submission. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, happy afternoon, everyone. So my, again, my name is Brian Dennis, and I'm just gonna do a um, brief walkthrough of the iowagrants.gov site, which is where you will go to do two uh, important things. One is to register to be able to apply for the grant. So if you've not done that, we'll go through that uh, at the beginning and then actually how to navigate the site to actually do your application. So I'm going to, um, if so, if I have the ability to share my screen, I will walk uh, folks through that.
Thank you very much. So. And share my screen, that was a tricky thing for me. So let me make sure I am on the uh, right link and then we'll get the screen shared. So give me one moment here. Okay, so can I get a thumbs up if you are seeing the welcome to iowagrants.gov. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Amy. All right, perfect. So I'm going to assume that no one has ever gone here before. If you have, please bear with me. But this is the iowagrants.gov site. So again, this is where you will go to be uh, first become a registered user, and then where you will go to actually do the grant application. So um, the first page is pretty self-explanatory. If you do not have a registration with Iowa Grants, uh, you'll go here to new, to new user registration and you will go through the information, you will list out your information, your contact, your email, um, the organization, the school district uh, that you are representing. And once you complete your registration process, an email will go to the administrative side of the grant, which uh, of the site, which would be include me and I'll just get an email going, uh, Larry Bice has uh, registered uh, and then I will go through and I will approve uh, you and then you'll get an email um, that you can then go into Iowa Grants. So once you get that email saying that you uh, have been registered, now occasionally the registration approval email goes to spam. It usually doesn't, but occasionally it does. So um, I try and go through these as quickly as I possibly can, but if it's been more than one business day since you completed the new user registration, I would suggest checking your spam just to make sure that it didn't wind up in your spam folder. But once you've been approved, uh, I will show you how to navigate it. So I'm gonna go in um, as a user. So uh, once you get the approval email, you come in as a returning user. And again, you will then have um, your account ID. That was a fun part when you type this in, make sure you type in the right password. Okay, so I was successful in logging in. So once you log in as an applicant, this will be what the home screen or your landing page will look like. So worst case scenario, if you ever get into Iowa Grants and you're not sure what to do, if you click menu, it will always bring you here. The first time you log in, it will bring you here. From this point, what you will then wanna do is obviously apply for the grant. So the first place that you're gonna go is funding opportunities. Now your display should look similar to this, but it may look a little different. And what you wanna do is once you click funding opportunities, this obviously brings up the various opportunities across several different program areas uh, that you could apply for funding. Now, as you can see, there's lots of different areas and sometimes it can be a little tricky to find a very specific funding opportunity. So I'm gonna give you a really quick um, hint here, uh, a little cheat, if you will. So one is to use the Control F key. If you click Control F, it brings up the keyword search and you can search for the grant based on the grant number. So the grant number for the Teacher Paraeducator RA grant is 442-221, 442-221. Two two one, and I can put that um, in the chat following uh, this presentation because anyone isn't sure. You have to put the name of the grant, but sometimes um, it's easier just to put in the number because that's going to be very unique. So as you can see uh, by my eyes, looks like it's an orange. It brings up the grant here. So this is the actual teacher and paraeducator registered apprenticeship grant. Once you actually locate the funding opportunity, you click on the blue link. And that's going to bring you to where you can begin an actual application. So as you see here, this has a synopsis of the funding opportunity. So there's my information as the uh, officer. I'm someone that you can definitely reach out to for questions, especially if you're having a tr uh, some difficulty navigating the system. If it's more the programmer side of the grant, I'm probably going to refer you to um, uh, Chris or Mimi, but you can always uh, shoot me an email or give me a call if you're stuck. You can scroll through here. Look at a lot of the information when it comes to the NOFO. 
Much of this has already been shown in the presentation. There's the two different models. If you continue to scroll down, it talks a lot about the ESSER funds, a lot of our definitions. And then near the very end of, the, of this part, it has the various attachment and the appendices. So this, these are the supplemental documents um, that are part of the grant application and also a great place to find resources. So there, these, all of these appendices, all of these supplemental documents are actually listed in a couple places. First is down here when you go to the actually starting an application, but I'll also show you another place where you can find them once you get into doing the application. But once you click on the name of the grant, you want to start an application. Pretty self-explanatory is starting an application. I've already started one just to make sure things looked right from the applicant side, but I'm going to start another one just to show you what it looks like. Um, the most important thing when starting this is to start a new application because the other parts of the application, other pieces that you need to submit, you can't do that until you actually start and name your application. So you click the start a new application. I'm the registered applicant, so it auto fills with my name. And then we're going to just go. So I know that this is not a real application. I'm just naming it another test app. What you name it obviously just depends on what you want to name your particular project. It's limited to 100 characters. I doubt we're going to find a project name that's beyond that. But this, again, is where you would name it. And it also auto populates to your organization. So uh, assuming that you're doing this on behalf of your public school district, it would have your district information from where you originally registered. Once you fill out the name of your project, you click Save. And now the program areas apprenticeship, again, there's that grant opportunity number in case anyone was looking for it. The application deadlines, this is also a quick place to see some really quick information. The deadline for the application is March 31st, 3 p.m. And again, just the identification number of your actual application, the name of your project, the registered applicant, and then the uh, person represent the organization that you're representing. This again is just starting from the uh, our side of it, this is that what this is just what we'll see as a quick synopsis of every application that comes in for these funds. To actually do the application, though, what you want to do is to go to application forms. Um, before I do that, I'll pause here for a quick second if anyone has any questions. But let's just say, just to give an example, yeah, let's say you put in the name of your project and you don't like it, you call it a misspelling, you can always change that by clicking here, the edit button. So if you misspell the name of your district, let's say, you can just click here, it's not written in stone, you can just go to edit and change it. So I will pause for questions uh, in one second, but before I do that, once you name your project, click go to application forms, and this is where you're going to start to fill out the rest of your application. Again, what you've done has filled out what's called the general information. You've named your project, but you actually need to obviously go through the other parts of the application. You can now see those. But before I go any more into this, are there any questions about those first couple steps about starting an application? Brian, there is one um, from sure. the questions and answers that asks, when applying, can we start the applica application and return later, or does it all have to be done at once? It absolutely can be started and stopped as many times as you want. So as you do this, and you'll see this when we get more into this, there is a save option at every part of the grant. And it's also uh, intuitive enough to know that if you are backing out of a section and you've made changes to, let's say, um, what, first thing I'll show you is the minority impact. Let's say you've made a change. With, with that area, it will tell you, hey, you're exiting with, do you want to save your changes? But yes, you can always save where you're at at any point in time with the application and come back. As long as you get it done by 3 p.m. on March 31st, you'll be good. All right. Um, if no other questions, I'll just walk you through a couple of the pieces of the actual application. Um, so first up is the minority impact statement. You click this link. 
And what this is asking for is to describe if you on the front end know that your application, your project is going to have either a positive or negative impact on any type of minority population. If you click no, then it will look just like this. You will click, if you click no, you don't foresee any positive impacts or you don't foresee any negative impacts. What you do is self-attest that your answers are honest and you fill in your information. However, if you click yes to either one of these questions, the boxes expand and ask for you to provide some narrative. So yes, we feel this is gonna have a positive impact on a minority population. Then what you do is to put your expected impact, your rationale for that, and then you select the population or populations plural that you feel this will impact. The way that you select the population is straightforward. You simply click on the name of the population. If you scroll down, there's several that are listed. If you feel you're going to have impact on more than one population, you would click on, let's say this is going to be beneficial to women and persons with disabilities. So you would click on person with disabilities, excuse me, women. And then before you click on another population, hold down the control. Most keyboards say CTRL, but hold down the control key and then click on any additional populations and they light up in blue. If you highlight one you didn't mean to, you can simply click out here in the yellow and then start again. Once you feel um, comfortable with your selections there, you then can scroll down to the next part. If you feel that there's maybe a negative impact, same deal, you would click yes. The same first questions, the same identifying of a population, but with negative impact, there is this piece that it asks you to provide information on um, how do you know that, like what consultation did you give? Once you're satisfied with your responses to the minority impact statement, though, what you do again is you click that you certified your answers are complete and accurate. So you, you're being honest in your responses. You fill in your information and all the way back up here at the top, you click save, right? And this save button is going to be everywhere. You also see here this edit button, which is shaded. Um, once you actually have a response to any section of the grant, this edit function does become active. I've not actually saved anything. That's why there's nothing to edit technically, but once there's actually something in here, then you can edit. And just to give a quick demonstration, I'm just gonna type letters and I will say this is gonna be beneficial to Latinos. Yes. So I'm project lead, my name, then save. And once that, that is saved, oh, it's I didn't complete all the required fields. What did I, what field did I miss? Okay, so again, I forgive me for just writing letters for content, but once that is in here, again, now if I want to change that, I can hit edit, and it brings this up for me to change. So again, that's probably pretty self-explanatory for folks on the call, but I did want to demonstrate that. Brian, once you're you not complete... sharing anymore. Oh. I'm not sure why we clicked off of share. Am I sharing again? Yep. Yes, sir. Go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and I'm not sure what part I was no longer sharing, but again, if you want to go in and edit once you provide information, you can obviously go in, click edit. Just make sure people caught all that. There is what I put in. You can change anything that you want to, and then you can, again, save it. Once you complete any particular section, you can go back to the application forms by always clicking this, go to application forms. And the application form just means the various pieces of the grant. Beyond that, we also have the cover sheet. The cover sheet is where you identify um, um, the various individuals who represent your organization with the grant application. 
So the authorized official is typically the person that is actually completing the grant. So if this was uh, my application, then I would fill in my information. Um, if the fiscal officer agent, they will put in their information. And this is where uh, also where you put in some additional information as far as where do you see your geographic footprint be? In other words, what counties and what parts of the state do you see uh, being impacted by your particular project? So for a local uh, public school district, we have all 99 counties in the state of Iowa, as well as a statewide option. You would simply click on the county or counties. Again, if you're making multiple selections, you will hold down the control button to select the counties that your project would impact. And down here at the bottom, we also have to identify your various districts, be it congressional, Senate, and House. We have in the blue link here that will take you actually to um, the Iowa um, redistricting site, which actually shows the current uh, representation of congressional Iowa and excuse me, congressional Senate and House districts. What I will do is show you that um, momentarily. So. Are folks seeing the uh, district lookup site now? Okay, perfect. If you click on the blue link in Iowa grants, it'll actually take you to this, but it actually takes you out um, of the application so you can so it can show you that. So I just want to went here and so you don't have to actually do that. To find out your representation when it comes to those districts, you simply will put in uh, the address representing your organization. I'm going, and it begins to autofill if you give it a moment. So I'm just going to put in the address of my office. So Avenue correctly. This is where Chris, Mimi, and I are sitting right now. So I click on that. And then it gives you the answers to your congressional district, which is for this location, District 3, House District 33, and Iowa Senate 17. And back in Iowa Grants, those are the answers to those questions. So you would simply list those answers here. And once you have this completely filled out again, you would save it and you would complete the, um, you have completed the cover sheet portion of your application. Any questions on what I've done so far regarding either the minority impact statement or the cover sheet, which again, the general information regarding your application. All right, the last couple pieces is the executive summary and then the uh, various attachments. So again, underneath the executive summary, it's gonna talk about your overall project. And once you enter in the project, you will save the information there. And then the last feature is actually where you add the additional attachments for the grant. So this is where you include your project narrative. So how do you see, how do you again, see your actual project being used for the RA, where you'd attach the budget, any information that comes to a letter of recommendation and um, um, there's actually some information when it comes to indirect costs. This is where you would attach documents. So let's say for your budget, you have this as an Excel spreadsheet. There actually is an Excel spreadsheet in the grant in the site. I'll show you that here in a moment. But once you um, have your budget, you would just attach a document. I'm assuming people have done this before, but in case they haven't, you would click choose file. You would then pick the document and then you would attach it here. Um, and once you do have all those pieces done, you've done your application, you've done the attachments piece. Go back to application forms. And once you have completed all of these areas, and as you click through, there will be an option for you to mark that you've done, that you're, you've completed a particular section. So as you begin to fill out each one of these sections and you save the information, the system will ask if you want to mark that particular section complete. If you do, 
that little black check mark will show up across each one of these areas. Once you feel that the grant is done, you're ready to complete it. You can hit preview and see the various sections that you've done. But most importantly, once you're done, you hit the submit button and it will actually submit your grant, which will then put it in the system as a completed submitted grant for uh, scoring later on. Um, are there any questions regarding what I've shown you so far? All right, a couple other things I will show you as we're finishing up. Once you have asked to begin an application and let's say someone asked today of uh, earlier, do you have to do it all in one sitting? No, you do not. But let's say you're working on a grant today, you get as much done as you can, you come back on Monday, you wanna start off where you left off. Once you've actually began a grant, you don't have to go through this funding opportunities anymore. What now becomes your landing spot for most of your work is gonna be going into my applications. So you log in, this will be your landing page. You click on my applications. And as you can see, I have several applications because I go in and test uh, many, many of our grants and they are in chronological order. So the most recent is at the bottom. So here is another test application. So if you click on this, this will actually take you to your application. So it tells you the funding opportunity that you actually are applying for. This is, a, I really like this. The Iowa works puts pretty much, excuse me, Iowa grants puts pretty much everywhere. The deadline date um, uh, when it comes to that. And then here's your actual application. It's an edit mode. If you click on this, it will take you back to your, um, to your sections when it comes to the different pieces of the grant. So are there any questions before um, I return this to the uh, team? Brian, I'll tell you what, why don't you, you know, you stay here. I've got there. I think there Absolutely. are some questions. We have 73 questions in the, in the Q and A. So if you do have mm -hmm. questions, we're going to ask you to throw them in the Q and A piece and we're going to go through them. We're going to answer them. Um, I'll answer a few. The first one I'm going to answer a little bit, and then Amy's going to jump in. Um, and then a lot of them, Chris um, and Brian will answer. So I'm just going to start taking us through the questions. Um, the first one is, would the department be willing to consider Head Start Classrooms as a partner? And I want to mention that we're partnering, that the, the, the awardee is a school district or a, a, a school, not necessarily a classroom. Um, and so if you're a part of that school or school district, you're okay, but I'm not that up on Head Start and requirements with Head Start, Amy. Yeah, um, I suspect that the question is whether uh, Head Start programs can be um, the, uh, the partner, um, not from the school, are they, are you asking if the Head Start program can be the school partner, right? So, um, or the school that's actually the applicant and the recipient of the funds. Um, and then um, they are actually getting the funds to have them um, kind of do the grow your own model and, and the folks who are doing the earn and learn. Um, the, and so the answer for this particular program is no, uh, because uh, Head Start organizations are not subrecipients, uh, proper subrecipients of these funds. Um, and uh, I understand why uh, you would want us to be able to distribute the funds to um, Head Start classrooms, uh, because uh, you know we do have shortages in early childhood as well. Um, it would be uh, fine for preschools that are part of a um, uh, a uh, public district to be, you know, for you to be working on getting paraeducators that are gonna be working in the preschool classrooms. But since Head Start is a separate organization and they receive their funding um, directly from the federal government, it goes direct um, to them through the, the regional Head Start organizations. Um, we can't actually distribute these funds to Head Starts. Thank you, Amy. Um, Jeff um, Halter asked, do community colleges that the high schools partner with have to have a para program recognized by the BOEE? And the answer is not necessarily so. Um, there's three things that we're trying to look at here. One is 
um, for people to um, be paid for working in schools, whether it's a para of teacher's aid. Another is to try to get um, college credit to will lead them toward that teaching degree. And the other is to get certification from the Board of Educational Examiners. Um, there are only three community colleges that have approved paraeducator programs, but virtually every AEA has a paraeducator program. So the partnership can include an AEA as well. Now an AEA doesn't, can't award college credit, but the AEA can award um, or, or can recommend a person to the BOEE for, for a para certificate. So you can um, consider your partnership to include whoever you need it to include based on what we're trying to get to, okay? Um, community colleges and four-year institutions must be Iowa-based, um, right? What about, the answer is yes, um, because you must be an Iowa-based institution to recommend for a license with the Board of Educational Examiners. You have to be approved by the State Board of Education um, in order to recommend for any kind of a license with the, um, uh, with the Board of Educational Examiners. Um, what about the RTI portion being allowed online? Fine. Um, will there be a pathway for experienced paraeducators who do not have an associate's degree? Um, yes. And I just mentioned that, you know, we can use an AEA to get the para certificate. Um, but the original pathway was high school to teacher, but that para certificate allows a person to earn money while they're going through the program. So it's a good way to go, but it's not a requirement. Um, okay, let's see. Would already employed paras keep their current pay? It's up to the school district. Um, what this is, the grant is going to do is provide for paras, provide $6 an hour for 30 hours a week for the, for the school district to pay the paras. What the school district pays the paras is up to the school district. Um, can applicants be currently enrolled in university classes? Uh, it's up to the district that is um, doing the, the partnership. And as far as a registered apprenticeship, um, Mimi and, and Chris, you don't have any, any problems with that, do you? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if a high school teacher is teaching math, can a high school student in this program still be in that classroom since per offer and teach, a high school teacher can be supervising two courses at once. Um, I'm gonna, Amy, you know, I, I don't know offer and teach well. So, and some of these questions, we may have to send you an answer if we can't do it. Right, so um, Tim, I'm a little bit unclear on what you're asking. Did you mean, that um, the high school teacher can't be the teacher of record for two courses at once. So they would be officially um, slated as teaching a math course and then the teacher of record for this um, registered apprenticeship at the same time. Um, if I've got that right, could you just let me know and you can even send me a private chat and then you can figure it out and I'll answer it. <laughs> Thanks. Um Central Community School District asked, how will the grants be awarded? So I think that that got our, that answered pretty well with um, Chris and Brian. So if, if that's still a question, um, throw it back in. Would 60 hours of college credit be considered equivalent to an associate's degree if a pair does not have an official associate's degree? Yes. In the eyes of the Board of Educational Examiners for a pair certificate, it's equivalent. Um, would four-year programs with an approved paraeducator program qualify as a partner for the high school to para model? Yes. Um, how do student, oops, it's, it's bouncing on me here. How do student teaching hours work, how do student teaching hours work with the apprenticeship, I think is the answer, is the question. Um, and this is where the partnership for the high school, excuse me, for the para to teacher piece is the partnership is so important because there are a lot of hours here. And if the college university is partnering 
very closely with the school district so that those para hours can be established and monitored and evaluated, they can be evaluated as student teaching. So the student teaching can be done as a paraeducator, but the, that institution, that college university still has to meet the student teaching requirements um, for the, the standards for educator prep programs. Um, do the high schools, do the high school juniors receive district credits in other core areas as they work as per educator for the graduation requirements of the district? In a registered apprenticeship, I believe, I'm, I'm gonna try to answer that. I'm not sure if I'm answering it correctly or not. Um, in a registered apprenticeship, if a junior is taking courses that meet the standards, now remember, you could have a standard in multiple classes or um, they could be meeting in multiple classes. Um, so you might have three standards in like a child development class that meet the registered apprenticeship piece, then it, we have to look at it differently. It's not necessarily within that class, but it's within uh, the standards that are provided for the registered apprenticeship. That makes sense. Thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> would this be available for someone who is a certified paraeducator and has their substitute authorization and works for multiple school districts? I, I want to emphasize this because we've got um, we've been getting quite a few emails asking this, and the grant award does not go to individuals. The grant award goes to a school district um, or a school, and the include you know who is included in that cohort is up to that school or district. So, um, I, you know, I think that, I hope that helps, but it's, we've, we've received a lot of, of, of questions from people about, can I apply for this? The answer is no, you as a person, you as a paraeducator, you as a student cannot. However, um, the, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I got distracted here, but, but um, anyway, um, the school district gets the partnership, the school district gets the award, um, it doesn't go to individuals. Uh, this Larry, there was, a, Please. there was a question that could probably jump off that. TJ Murphy asks if we're working with several districts who applies for the grant, does each district apply? And I would say it's, it's a conglomerate. It would be one district would choose to be the lead on it with the partnerships with each one of the districts and each one of the community college, you know, however that that would be identified in the application process itself. So one idea for registered apprenticeships, we know that we have uh, 20 registered apprenticeship high school programs in the state. It, you know, it is easier to jump a red, expand a registered apprenticeship off of a program that's already established that might be a way to look at it. Um, or if one district wants to get a conglomerate of a bunch of districts and create their own registered apprenticeship, that is an option too. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a great question from Shauna Hudson. Is, there, is this for any area of teacher education, any endorsements? And we, we we're going to sit down here in the next week or so and, and line up what does the coursework look like in that. The focus is gonna be professional core type coursework. Um, and then how do we fit the other pieces in there? Um, I would say that it's going, the idea is that it will work for uh, as many gen ed programs as possible. Um, I, I think the larger programs like a, a, a strat one in particular, it would be pretty hard to do. Um, we got a, a, a question from a student um, who's going to a college and is interested in how does this, um, can I apply for this and how will this benefit me? Again, I think you need to talk to, I would, first of all, I'd talk to your, your advisor and then talk to um, the school district that is, is close to you that they may be partnering with. Um, a year long sub teacher qualifies. Uh, yeah, it, again, 
it's up to the district that gets the award. So if there's a, if somebody who's working as a sub for you, um, if you wanna have that person as a part of this grant process, um, you know, I don't think that's gonna be a problem for anybody. Um, what if the, oh, I'm losing it. What if a para has only two or three classes shy of their degree for teaching? Are they still required to complete the whole program? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Chris to talk about the registered apprenticeship because the, it's really not designed for um, a school district to bring in somebody that is this close to being finished. Larry, what was the question again? I'm sorry. So the, the question is, um, I'm a, um, I'm, I've got somebody that's a sub for me that's two or three courses shy of completing their teacher certification. Yeah, it probably wouldn't fit within the registered apprenticeship piece because the registered apprenticeship uh, minimum standards, 144 RTI hours with 2000 on the job training hours. So it probably wouldn't fit there. Thank you. Is there a maximum number of apprentices? No, um, there's a maximum number of dollars. So there's $9 million of ESSER funds to support this as a grant. But if, you know, if you want to put programs together or you have programs together that have been operating, want to operate without the funding, you know, that's great. If you want to start up a registered apprenticeship, you know, you don't get funding, you want to start up a re registered apprenticeship, call up Chris or call up Mimi and say, hey, I want to start up a registered apprenticeship and they'll work with you. We'll get these things going. Um, it's the limiting factor right now is just the money for the grants. Um, I think the question is, is would I be hired on as a registered apprentice or a paraeducator? And I think the answer is just yes, either way. Um, you know, the paraeducator is a way to, to get payment within the registered apprenticeship. Am I, Chris, am I misspeaking in that regard? No, that's correct. Okay. Um, What, oh, um, this is a, um, I'm gonna give this question to, to Chris as well. Would proposals reaching more apprentices than a minimum be competitive? Minimum is 10. So I think it goes to what, is, what are the requirements, uh, what are the, the weighting factors for award? Uh, I believe that would be weighted highly. Um, let me make sure within the NOFO and I can answer that in a second. Um, well, Chris is looking that up. I can do an, another one. Um, are the districts required to find the classes or will the classes be offered online for students? That's going to be a partner. That's going to be a part of that partnership. And we're going to get together, um, DE, um, Workforce Development, we're going to get together and basically put an outline of what kind of coursework should be in there. And then it's just a matter of working with um, your partner to plug those in. Um, and again, whether they're online, face-to-face, -face, um, whether they're on the college campus or whether the college comes to the school district, that's entirely up to however you develop that partnership. Okay, Chris? Larry? Um... It would it would fall within uh, program design. It would also fall in to number of anticipated registered apprentices. So there is a point value for the number of registered apprentices and also the organizational capacity. So showing that um, the organization can handle that capacity as well as um, the number of registered apprentices both are in there. Thank you, thank you. Um, Jane Smith asks, did the task force look at adults who already have a bachelor's or a master's degree, but just do not have the courses that would credential them as teachers? Yes, I'm going to tell you that this task force looked at everything. Um, we talked about everything. Um, we didn't go in that direction because um, currently we have our two alternative licensure programs that are designed for those people, um, get them into the classroom as an intern relatively quickly. Um, one of those is at Morningside University and the other is uh, Regents University's consortium called RAPL. Um, 
The one and only Chad Jansen asks, uh, we have a Grow Your Own Teacher program we started this year, which is for seniors only. For this program to work, would we need to start as juniors? Um, and well, Chris, do you want to talk about that first? You don't care, do you? No, I, I think um, as long as the sponsor or the business is saying, or the school in this instance, is saying that they've met that um, RTI time in a junior or senior year, um, and it's satisfying that that time and that, I think, hitting those standards, I think it's going to be fine. Thank you. And, and Chad goes on to ask, do you have to get your paraeducator first before you can do the teacher prep? In other words, could a high school student be working toward a teacher certificate? And that, Chad, is exactly what the task force design is, high school students to teacher certificate. Um, but what we did is put that para piece in there um, as a way for that person to be earning money as he or she goes through the program. Um, <clears throat> Um, Chris is going to be for you as well. If awarded the grant, or maybe Brian, but if you are, are awarded the grant, what timeline do we have as a public school to be approved as a registered apprenticeship? I think that's something that um, we can scale a registered apprenticeship anywhere from 30 to 60 days. Um, we have our uh, business marketing specialist ready to go to um, help support that. Um, so it can it can be scaled fairly quickly, and the Office of Apprenticeship is always willing to help and learn too um, as we go forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, our support salaries, like a lead teacher, mentor, um, eligible expense, they're not put they're not specifically targeted in the uh, grant award. The grant award is for either high school students or employees of the district um, as they're moving through. Um, Uh, why are we limiting the awards to 2025 districts? What we're really trying to do is, first of all, we have $9 million, which limits awards on that. And we're trying to give each award enough money to get a person to an associate's degree or to a bachelor's degree. And then it's just however many of those we can split into $9 million. Um, <clears throat> Has there been consideration for the time commitment and equity issues placed on small rural districts with the creation of a competitive grant? You're asking for a significant amount of time. Um, multiple districts already short on staff um, with a large chance of not receiving the grant award. Is there a more ethical and realistic way to disseminate these funds to the people across the state that would, that would benefit from them? Um, you know, and, and I'll, you know, Amy, you might want to jump in here, but I think the, the way we've targeted this was, was just that to try to be as equitable as we could with the funding in this process. Yeah, I don't, <clears throat> I don't have anything additional to add to that, Larry. Okay, thank you. Um, Chad comes in again here. Um, how does the training for para certification at a higher ed institution differ from para certification through the AEA? The AEA has three courses. Basically, they meet the same requirements, 50 hours, 50 contact hours, and some clinical experiences. Um, so either, either one is, is certainly an option to go either way. Um, are the required credit hours for the paraeducator to teacher program participants the same full course load that a traditional student would be required as a full-time student? Not necessarily, the, the number of credits, in order to get a bachelor's degree, you have to have 128 credits. So you've got to get there somehow. Um, the model basically is, is um, the tuition model is based on full-time tuition, which would be 12, 15 credits a semester. Um, but there's nothing in this that says you must do this many credits. The thing is, if you don't finish it within the two years, you know, you're just, you're just not gonna have grant support for it, but it can still continue on until you're finished. Can an AEA offer training classes for paraeducators and be funded for them through the program? 
um, the funding is going to go to the school district for this program. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, Amy, can they subcontract to, um, I mean, the, the money identifies salaries and tuition. So there's not really an earmark for paying an AEA, but. Um, there's not an earmark. I, you know, I think the, <clears throat> the big consideration is whether credit can be awarded for the associate's degree here. And so the preference is that the outcome is that um, the participant is getting the credit that can then enable them um, to move toward, you know, if they wanted to go the next step to go from paraeducator to teacher, um, they would have um, the credit to go for another credential, right? Um, and AEAs cannot award that credit. That doesn't mean that having going through the AEA program isn't a good thing to do. Um, so um, they can't, you know, the AEAs can't be funded through this program to be the uh, awarder of credit. But if AEAs had people who um, wanted to move from being a paraeducator to a teacher, AEAs are proper subrecipients of ESSER funds. Um, okay. So they theoretically could be um, the employer uh, in, in this instance and actually um, have employees who are benefiting. Um, I'm not sure how often that would happen. Um, that if, but if it if it's happening and there are people who could benefit from this, then um, that that could actually work. And if, so, if I, I think we have to think it through a little bit more before we put an answer in writing. But we did have a request to get all these answers in writing, and so we can do that. Right. Exactly. That's why we wanted all these answers in the questions and answers. Yeah. All these questions and the questions and answers. But I think part of the I think a, a big part of this question is. You know, if I'm, you know, if I'm waving grass Iowa school district and I'm partnering with a community college to get an associate's degree for my high school students, but that community college doesn't have a para program um, for my students, I can still use this money to pay that 120 or however much it is to an AEA for them to get the para certificate. That, I think that's the question, and I think the answer is yes, but we'll make sure we, we write that out and, and reply back on that one. Um, oh, Amy, stay unmuted here. How does this program tie into the IRS limit of $5,250 for tuition reimbursement for employees to make the contribution non-taxable to the employee? Yeah, <clears throat> so we're gonna have to run that one by our attorney uh, who is not on today. So unless workforce development has their attorney on, I'm going to punt on that one and not um, try to answer it until uh, we actually um, get that one over my attorney. So thanks, Larry, for handing it over to me. And I'm going to hand it over to somebody who's not here. But um, we're going to get these posted. Um, we'll have the answers on our site and then on workforce development site, too. So we'll make sure that you can access them. OK, thank you um, for the parent to teacher pathway, do districts have flex on the salary benefits of these apprentices as long as it does not exceed 50% of their salary and grant funds do not exceed 47,000? Yeah, you can pay whatever you want to paras. Um, it's just that the grant's gonna provide $6 an hour of that. So if you pay them 12, the grant provides half. If you pay them, pay them 24, then the grant provides a quarter. Um, what type, okay, we've answered that one, I'm gonna move on forward here, what, um, with anticipation of 100 individual participants, how many districts are likely to obtain this grant? What's the expected number of awards? Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we've kind of left that open, the expected number of awards, you know, if, it, if everything was just um, cookie cutter, it would be 10 awards of 10, um, but we're gonna have larger cohorts. We're gonna have um, maybe two districts together. Um, so it's hard to say, but we're going to award nine million dollars to to fund these this work. Um, is there Kelly Cheney? Is there a proposed rules change to Chapter seventy nine or Chapters thirteen and fourteen 
um, in the required number of content hour area coursework or field experiences for student teaching. So will the requirements to become a teacher in administrative rule change? And as it stands right now, no. The, the plan is that we can do this. The registered apprenticeship will fit nicely um, in the requirements that we have now with some very serious um, oversight monitoring collaboration. Um, that one. Is there a list of the school districts that have already expressed interest or already have registered apprenticeships? Not at this time, no. Okay. Um, assuming school districts, stay unmuted, Chris. Assuming school districts will have to go through the regular approval process for these apprenticeships through the U.S. Department of Labor. So do they still need to go through U.S. Yes, Department? Yes, that's, that's correct. Okay. Um, if the district has not created a registered apprenticeship program within, with Iowa Workforce, can they still apply for the grant? Sorry, Larry, say that one again. Okay. I'm reading, I'm doing the same thing you're doing. <laughs> and, and every time a new question comes in, it pops away from me. So um, I am on, um, uh, Lisa Sullivan asks, if the district has not created a registered apprenticeship program with workforce development, can they still apply for the grant? Well, they can create one to, you know, it's it's for existing or uh, registered apprenticeships or to kick off a new registered apprenticeship. So yeah, they can apply to become a new registered apprentice or a sponsor. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, this I, we've got a student or a, a paraeducator asked a question about how to apply. But again, talk to your district, talk to your school district, um, because the school district has to apply. Um, oh, this is a great question. If is there something the Iowa Workforce Development and or State Department of Ed will continue? Is this something that Workforce Development will continue once the ESSER funds are discontinued? You want, to have, you want to hit that one, Chris? Well, I'd, I'd love to be able to say, yeah, we're going to do that with $9 million, but I think um, it's all going to depend on the success and what we see um, with our results. Obviously, we want this to be successful and be able to support paraeducators and teachers as much as possible. Um, and, you know, I think what we're going to see is as schools start to do this, hopefully uh, they're finding a talent pipeline to help themselves. I, um I'm going to take this opportunity to jump in on that too. And we're actually a little over time, I think, um, I, though Hannah can correct me. Um, so I won't take too long, but, you know, uh, I think this helps respond to, to a couple of the um, questions or comments we've had about, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that there aren't more awards or that it could be difficult for smaller schools to um, put together a cohort of 10. Um, you know, so this grant opportunity isn't intended to fix every issue that we have with shortages. It's intended to do um, a couple of things. One is definitely fix some things, right? Like, you know, we want to make sure that we're making um, uh, strides toward getting more people uh, licensed um, and teaching in our schools and making it cost effective, right? Um, and we want to make it easier for schools to do something that is the, the grow your own model and um, make it so that people can actually work um, and get more credentials as they're working. That said, um, do we want to continue this? We'd love to, uh, we wanna see how well it works first. So this is like a, a, a much larger pilot than we would typically do as a pilot, right? And so we, we think of this as an exploratory project with um, the funds that we are really fortunate to have right now. Um, I uh, talked with a group yesterday um, where a, a couple of members of the group said, it seems like we have a lot of things that we try for pathways to get more teachers. But then it's like we have so many things, we don't know which ones work best. 
And it would be really nice um, to come out the other side of this and know how well it worked and then what funds to put into the things that work best to make sure that we are continuing to um, get the best uh, candidates to be in our schools that we can. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do here. And so if you're hearing like some people aren't going to get this, well, we know some people aren't going to get it, but um, this is an opportunity for us to try something that could be the next thing that works really well in our state. Um, so we're really excited to have the opportunity to do it. And we hope you really want to work with us um, to get that done. So um, that's my two cents for today, since I, I wasn't uh, talking too much. Um, and Hannah verifies that we're over time. So um, I know that we still have a lot of questions left and um, we're gonna make sure that we get all of the questions answered um, and that we post them uh, along with all of the information on how to apply. Um, uh, even though we're over time, I just wanna make sure that um, any of our presenters have a moment to say uh, anything that they have left before we stop the recording and sign off. I think we're good, Amy. Sounds good. Well, I just want to thank everyone for being here today and um, let you know that we'll get everything posted as soon as possible. So um, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.